lots to think about in regards to this. Let's see if we can get some answers now. And we are joined by Obed Koringo, who's a climate policy advisor at CARE International. Obed, thanks for your time on this. So the agreement was made at COP27 a little under one year later. What's been set up to operationalize this fund, despite, of course, the discussion around who should put what into the fund? Thank you so much, uh, Wahiga, for having me. Yes, uh, the issue of loss and damage uh, has really been evolving over time. And as you, as you just said, at COP27, it was quite a very, very monumental moment where uh, countries agreed to establish a loss and damage fund to be able to uh, uh, address the losses and damages that are come as a result of climate change. Uh, at COP27, of course, um, countries established a loss and damage transitional uh, committee that was going to look at uh, how uh, this fund is going to look like and, and, and the operational modalities. And this transitional committee has been meeting throughout the year and has come up with uh, recommendations on how this fund is going to look like. Of course, uh, we are not very happy with the recommendations uh, because we thought that they will come up with a, a recommendation that will provide for a standalone uh, uh, entity to be able to uh, uh, host this fund. And the issues of uh, common but differentiated responsibilities are really not very much reflected uh, in, in terms of uh, the recommendations uh, to, to the COP28 on how this fund is going to look like. So we still have a window at COP28 to be able to interrogate this further and the recommendations from the Transitional Committee in order to ensure that we have a fund that really meets uh, the purpose and serve the purpose that we really want to see in order to address uh, the, the, the loss and damage issues that uh, committees are facing. I mean, Obed, I can imagine people living in areas affected by floods or drought in 2023 across sub-Saharan Africa are watching an interview like this and wondering, I mean, it's great to hear that that loss and damage fund was set up, but when might available funds be actually channeled to assist us? That's what some of them might be asking this evening. Yeah, this is really a very a very good question, but also we're also asking, and, and of course we are banking on COP28 to be able to come up with a very... Uh, sort of tangible outcome in terms of operationalizing this fund. Uh, of course, we have seen historically uh, developed countries who are primarily responsible for, for climate change really uh, dilly-dallying and, in, in, and, and not really being able to meet their commitments, especially when it comes to uh, climate finance. Uh, but we really uh, are hopeful that COP28 is go going to come up with a, a, an, a, an outcome that is going to uh, provide for operationalizing of this fund. And what we are asking for is a fund that is accessible to the communities, a fund really that all developing countries who are already affected are able to uh, access. And of course, special attention really being meant to ensure that particularly marginalized communities and marginalized uh, individuals are able to access. And by access really, I mean that there's timely provision. When you talk about loss and damage, you're talking about life and death issues. So we need a timely provision in the context of rapid onset and slow onset impacts. And of course, more direct funding to local organizations. So basically at COP28, of course, we are hopeful and we are pushing for a fund that really uh, should be uh, flexible and accessible. Oh, by Obed, I, I want to jump. Course. I want to jump in, Obed, if you can hear me. Uh, I like discussing yes, yes. scenarios, and, and on this one, I'm going to ask you about a worst case scenario. If COP28 yeah. uh, fails to advance this issue, there's no agreement at the end of it of how to move forward. What next? What other options are there for vulnerable nations, especially those in Sub-Saharan Africa and in the Sahel? Well, Higa, um, honestly, I do not want to discuss that. I mean, that's not on the table <laughs> from where we, st we stand. Uh, we are optimistic, really optimistic that COP28 will make significant uh, progress in achieving uh, really the needed uh, fund uh, uh, and an outcome that is really uh, required to establish a loss and damage fund. Uh, you saw the recent Africa Climate uh, Declaration uh, that was held in Nairobi. Uh, Africa Climate Summit really reaffirmed really the need for COP28 to urgently operationalize. And we believe that all developing countries and including the Africa Group of Negotiators and uh, Africa uh, and, and allies really will put a spirited fight to ensure that this is achieved. So we do not want anything less than uh, short of uh, a fully operationalized loss and damage. And we need a finance mechanism that is able to support a wide range of activities. Of course, this, of course, includes 
uh, relief in the aftermath of, of the disasters, as well as, of course, long-term uh, rehabilitation and reconstruction efforts, and a fund that is really able to put in front the uh, women-led organizations, marginalized groups, in, including indigenous communities, as well as those who are already in the front lines of climate uh, disasters. But, but meanwhile, Obed, so what responsibility might there be? Because obviously a lot of focus is on the heavily industrialized nations who are being blamed for uh, you know, a big part of climate, climate change and climate impact we're looking at. But for those that contribute very little to the, to the climate challenge that we find ourselves in, especially countries across sub-Saharan Africa, what can they do? Is there any innovation where they can begin putting in even if it's limited funds into this loss and damage fund? What obligation is there on them is what I'm trying to ask. Yeah, first of all, allow me uh, to mention that Af countries, especially those in Africa, really contribute the, the least. Actually, like Africa contributes only about 3.8% uh, uh, of global greenhouse gas emissions and bears alarmingly high economic costs. Uh, of course, and this you look at like um, in 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 the, in the southern Africa, for instance, we've seen devastating cyclones. We've seen prolonged droughts in the Horn of Africa. These countries are already bearing the brand of uh, of climate change, of disasters, of, of of loss and damages. So why should we put more uh, sort of responsibilities on these countries? This responsibility really solely lies on those who have caused this problem that we are facing. The, the, the principle of equity and, of course, common but differentiated right. responsibilities really puts this at the, at the core of those who have caused okay. this problem. Yeah.